Hi. Today we're starting chapter 7 in Schroeder's Thermal Physics and it deals with Gibbs factors. So previously we were talking about the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for an ideal gas. Um, so we were dealing with classical systems. And in those systems we were allowing the energy uh, between a system and a reservoir to be freely exchanged, but we were not allowing an exchange of particles. Now to go further in our studies of statistical mechanics, we're going to have to allow the number of particles to be exchanged as well. Okay, so now we have a system and a reservoir in contact with one another, and they're allowed to exchange energy and or particles. Okay. So what we can do is we can say that if the system and its reservoir go through some process, some change, then that will cause a change in the entropy of those things. So the total entropy of both the system and reservoir can be written as S total, which is equal to S cis plus S res. The total entropy will be the entropy of the system plus its reservoir. If it goes through some change, some process, then that will vary, and we can write ds total is equal to ds of the system plus ds of the reservoir. All right, now we are going to still approximate any change in volume from the loss or gain of a single particle, for example, or if a particle changes its energy state, we're going to assume that that change in volume is negligible. So we're going to set dv as approximately equal to zero for all of our um, stuff from here on out. And if we use the um, thermodynamic identity, remember that the thermodynamic identity says du is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu dn. If we rearrange that and solve for ds, we have ds is equal to 1 over t times du plus PDV minus mu dn. We set dv as equal to 0 so that we have ds is 1 over t times du minus mu dn. All right, now. If the system and the reservoir are um, freely exchanging energy and particles, what will happen is that if the system loses something, the reservoir gains it and vice versa. So du of the system could be written as negative du of the reservoir, and dn of the system could be written as negative dn of the reservoir. They're related to one another via minus sign. So looking at this relationship, what we could do then is say that any change in energy of the system du cis would be minus du for the reservoir, and any change dn of the system would be minus dn of the reservoir. That means that we can write the change in entropy of the reservoir with respect to the change in entropy of the system this way. ds for the reservoir is equal to negative 1 over t times du cis minus mu dn cis. Okay? Now remember here, mu is the chemical potential. Now taking that equation from the previous slide, we could talk about what this change in entropy is from. Let's say that the change in entropy is from moving from one energy state to another energy state and the number of particles that make that move from one to the other. Okay, So we could write that change is now a finite amount as a delta S and that would be the uh, entropy of the reservoir when the system was in state 2 minus the entropy of the reservoir when the system was in state 1. Okay, so that delta S would then be equal to negative 1 over the temperature times the energy of state 2 minus the energy of state 1, right? And then the number of particles that moved from state 2 to state 1. So that would be written as minus 1 over T times E of S2 minus mu N in S2 minus e of state 1 minus mu times n of state 1. Okay, So in other words, we're looking at the number that moved from state to state and the energy that moved from state to state. So we're taking this little bit of the thermodynamic identity that we've kept and plugging in for that. Okay, Now this is the energy of the system and so that's going to be equal to the change in energy of the system will be equal to the change in energy of the single particle that makes that move if that's the only change that occurs. Okay. Now, let's think about what we did before in our previous studies of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Remember that previously, if we wanted to know the ratio of the probability that particles were in some state 2 versus some state 1, we could find that ratio by taking the ratio of the multiplicities for those two states. So the probability that a particle is in state 2 relative to the probability that a particle is in some state 1 would be equal to the multiplicity of state 2 divided by the multiplicity of state 1. Okay. Now, 
Given that the entropy is equal to Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of the multiplicity, S is equal to K log omega, we can rearrange and solve for omega, and omega would be equal to E to the S over K power, and that would be true for either one of these states. So omega 2 over omega 1 is E to the S 2 over K divided by E to the S 1 over K, okay? And then that's just E to the delta S over K, right? Because when you take the ratio of these exponentials like that, then you subtract their exponents, okay? So then you would have E of S2 minus S1 over K, and that's exactly what we've solved for here, okay? Now, this could equivalently be written as an expression of the ratio of those exponentials. So this would be E to the negative E of state 2 minus mu of number of particles in state 2 divided by kt, and then the same thing for state 1 in the bottom there, okay? Now these are called Gibbs factors. So just like e to the minus es over kt was called a Boltzmann factor, this e to the minus e minus mu n divided by kt, that is a Gibbs factor, okay? And you could also look at this then as the delta e's. So we're introducing a new factor called the Gibbs factor, but it's very in line with what we've learned before about Boltzmann factors, okay? So that means that you might not be surprised to realize that just like we learned about partition functions before, there's going to be an equivalent in expression for um, Gibbs factors. So remember that the partition function is the sum over all the states of the Boltzmann factors, Right? And now our grand partition function is going to be the sum over all the states for the Gibbs factors. All right. So we have to kind of distinguish between in notation our partition function, which we just wrote as a capital Z, and a grand partition function. And I chose this funky looking Z here. I'll call it funky Z. Okay. Um, all right. So my grand partition function, funky z, will be equal to the sum over all the states of my Gibbs factors. And then the probability of a single state would be 1 over funky z times the Gibbs factor for that state. Just like, just like the partition function and the Boltzmann factors. All right. Now I'd like at this time to introduce some new vocabulary that they actually use in statistical mechanics. So if you continue on after this class in your studies of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, you're going to hear these terms a lot. And you might hear them a lot in graduate school in physics or engineering. And so it's a nice time to introduce this vocabulary. Ready? Okay, so I stole this from Wikipedia because I actually kind of like the way Wikipedia says it a little bit better than I like the way the textbook does. Sorry, Schroeder, sorry. But here we go. This is a quote. In mathematical physics, especially as introduced in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics by Gibbs in 1902, an ensemble, which is also called a statistical ensemble, is an idealization consisting of a large number of virtual copies, sometimes infinitely many, of a system considered all at once each of which represents a possible state that the real system might be in. In other words, a statistical ensemble is a probability distribution for the state of a system. Okay, so let's think about it. What we said here, an idealization consisting of a large number of virtual copies, sometimes infinitely many of the system, that's macrostate, right? And microstate. So remember for our ideal gas, if you give the pressure, volume, temperature, and number of particles of an ideal gas, you've described the macro state of the system, and then all the imaginary possible ways those particles could be arranged is the micro states, okay, and there's a number, a large number, sometimes almost infinitely number, many, number of micro states of a system for a given macro state, okay, so remember that language. So the language here kind of matches, okay, so when we're talking about the macro state of a system, we're also describing an ensemble. Okay. All right, so a thermodynamic ensemble is a specific variety of a statistical ensemble that, among other properties, is in statistical equilibrium, defined below, and is used to derive the properties of thermodynamic systems from the laws of classical or quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're talking about thermodynamic ensembles. Now, a canonical ensemble 
That's the statistical ensemble that represents the possible states of a mechanical system that's in thermal equilibrium with a heat bath at a fixed temperature. The system can exchange energy with a heat bath so that the states of the system will differ in total energy. That's exactly what we were doing in Chapter 6. We had an ideal gas, right, that was in contact with a reservoir. And from that reservoir, it could exchange energy, but not particles, okay? It could exchange energy, causing those particles within that ensemble to jump into excited states, okay? So that's what we had. And then what we defined is the partition function, which is also known in thermodynamics as the canonical partition function. And the canonical partition function Z is the sum over all the Boltzmann factors, okay? So that's the language that's used in statistical mechanics. If you see this, they'll call it the canonical partition function. When they say canonical, that means that energy is allowed to be exchanged, but not anything else. All right, now here we go. Chapter 7 starts a discussion of what's known as the grand canonical ensemble. Let's read it together. In statistical mechanics, a grand canonical ensemble is the statistical ensemble that is used to represent the possible states of a mechanical system of particles that are in thermodynamic equilibrium, both thermal and diffusive, with a reservoir. The system is said to be open in the sense that the system can exchange energy and particles with the reservoir so that the various possible states of the system can differ in both their total energy and total number of particles. The system's volume, shape, and other external coordinates are kept the same in all possible states of the system. And here is the grand canonical partition function, funky Z, which is the sum over all the Gibbs factors. All right? So you've heard the canonical ensemble. That's the ensemble used to describe the physics of an ideal gas, classical particles. And now you're dealing with the grand canonical ensemble, which goes a step further and allows energy and particles to be exchanged. So I think that an example is worth a million words, and I'm going to um, kind of redo the example that's given in Schroeder here, which is carbon monoxide poisoning, just because, you know, if you really want your students to pay attention, you can do one of two things, um, and I usually choose the second one, which is get morbid with it. So here we go. Let's get morbid with it. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, I am not a biologist, so I'm just going to, you know, preface this by saying that a lot of this, not fully within my schoolyard. So let's just go. Hemoglobin, though, is the molecule or protein here in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to tissues all over the body. And it brings carbon dioxide, CO2, back from those tissues. Now, here's the problem. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin a lot better than oxygen, over 200 times more easily. So if carbon monoxide is present, oxygen won't be able to find space to get into the hemoglobin because the carbon monoxide will be sitting there. It's already occupied with the carbon monoxide. And as a result, parts of the body will be starved of oxygen and the affected parts will die. The human body needs oxygen, but it has no use for carbon monoxide. So if we breathe in the carbon monoxide, it takes up the bonding sites, right? that the oxygen usually occupies, and we're deprived of oxygen. So that's a quote from Christian Nordquist in Carbon Monoxide, the Silent Killer. Okay, so, you know, people think of carbon monoxide as a poison, but it, what it's really do is kind of smothering you, if you think about it. All right. Now, hemoglobin, as shown in this little sketch here, um, which I took from an article by Charles Davis, Hemoglobin is made of four protein molecules, which are globul globulin chains that are connected together. And each globulin chain contains an important iron-containing compound turned heme. Embedded within the heme is an iron atom that is vital in transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide in our blood. And the iron contained in the hemoglobin is also responsible for the red color of the blood. So we have these bonding sites, right, that either the oxygen or the carbon monoxide can take. So. Let's examine the probability for a single iron site being occupied. Now, if only oxygen is present, then there's just two choices. It's either occupied or it's not occupied. And if it's occupied, then, uh, if it's not occupied, I mean, then the energy is zero and the number of particles is zero. And if it is occupied, the number of um, particles is one and the energy is lowered to negative 0.7 electron volts. 
Okay, so we couldn't do this example before, you see, because we weren't allowing particles to change. The number of particles couldn't vary. But now we have a choice with this new formalism as to whether the site is occupied or not. Does it have a particle or not, right? Okay, now we need to then plug into this equation um, and find our uh, funky z, our grand partition function by summing over the Gibbs factors, which is e to the minus e of the state minus mu n of the state divided by kt. Okay, so we know energies and ends for those two conditions, but we really need to find the chemical potential mu. We need to solve for that, okay? Now, what we're going to do in this problem is we're going to treat the oxygen in the blood like an ideal gas, and we're going to say that since oxygen makes up about 20% of the air that you breathe, it's going to have a partial pressure of 0.2 atmospheres. Now, this isn't entirely accurate once you get into the bloodstream, but we're just going to go with it. We're going to have the temperature be the temperature of the human body, which is about 310 Kelvin. Okay? Now, we can solve for the chemical potential for an ideal gas. We have an expression for that. Um, and it's from the previous chapter. So here the chemical potential mu is minus kT times the natural log of Vz internal divided by N times the quantum volume. Okay, so here K is Boltzmann's constant. T is the temperature. V over N is the volume per molecule, right? Z internal is the rotational partition function and V sub Q is our quantum volume. Now we can use the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NKT, and rearrange it and solve for V over N. V over N is KT over P, okay? Now, uh, plugging in what we have, K is Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. T is the temperature, 310 Kelvin, and P would be the partial pressure of the oxygen, which would be 0.2 atmospheres or 0.2 times 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. Because remember, 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals is one atmosphere of pressure. I changed the units here so that everything is SI, which means that V over N would be then 2.11 times 10 to the minus 25 cubic meters per molecule. Now, we can also solve for the quantum volume. The quantum volume, if you remember from discussions in the previous chapter, was h over the square root of 2 pi mkt cubed. Now, h is Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 in SI units. k and t, I've described previously, Boltzmann's constant in the temperature. Now, the mass would be the mass of a single oxygen molecule. The mass of a single oxygen molecule is two oxygen atoms, so that's 16 atomic mass units per atom, or 32 atomic mass units total. There's 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms in a single atomic mass unit, which makes the mass for an oxygen molecule 5.3 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Now also in the previous chapter, chapter 6, we talked about what the rotational partition function Z internal is. So we had an expression that for a diatomic molecule like oxygen, which has two same atoms on either side, Z internal is kT over 2 epsilon. And also, we previously discussed what epsilon is for oxygen. In a previous chapter, we found that epsilon is 0.00018 eV for oxygen. So plugging in for that, we can solve for Z internal, and Z internal is 74. It's a dimensionless number. So now we can plug into our expression for the chemical potential mu, okay? Mu is equal to minus kT times the natural log Vz internal over N times the quantum volume. And if you plug all those things in using units for K, 8.617 times 10 to the minus 5 eV per Kelvin, okay? Then you get mu is negative 0.6. Okay, so mu is negative 0.6 eV. Now we have everything that we need to plug in to funky z, our grand partition function. So if you sum over the two possibilities that the state is occupied or not, right, then first of all, if the state is not occupied, then you have the energy is zero and the number of particles is zero. That gives e to the zero, so that's just one. Now if the state is occupied, then the energy of the state is negative 0.7 eV, mu is negative 0.6 eV, right, and n is 1. So if you plug in, you have e to the minus negative 0.7 eV minus the minus 0.6 eV divided by kT, which is 0.027 eV at 310 Kelvin. So that gives you the second term here of being 41. 
and then you have 1 plus 41 is 42. So our grand partition function, funky z, is 42. Now, to find the probability of occupation by oxygen, you just take the Gibbs factor for the state and divide it by the grand partition function. And that gives you, um, if we summed over the possibilities of it not and being there, then we have z is 42, funky z is 42. And then remember, for it being occupied, the Gibbs factor was 41. So 41 over 42 is 0 0.98. That means that there's a 98% probability of occupation without the presence of a carbon monoxide. If just oxygen is there, in other words, then oxygen and nitrogen, then you've got a 98% probability of occupation. So the oxygen is easily bound to the hemoglobin and makes it to the cell. But if carbon monoxide is present, there's now three choices not occupied, occupied by carbon monoxide, or occupied by oxygen. So let's look at a partial pressure of carbon monoxide that actually leads to death at continued exposure, okay? So the threshold that I could find is if you have continued exposure to carbon monoxide, like you're, I don't know, uh, you've got some kind of accident or you're breathing in from your tailpipe or something inside your car, if you have 200 parts per million of carbon monoxide that can lead to death, which is not very much. So that's um, uh, in terms of parts per million, 0 0.0002 atmospheres of partial pressure. All right. Now 0 0.0002, three zeros and a two atmospheres. If you calculate V over N for that, remember before we had 0.2, right? And now we have 0 0.0002. So that's a thousand times larger for V over N. So that means that V over N is 2.11 times 10 to the minus 22 meters cubed per atom or molecule. Now, we already solved for Z internal for carbon monoxide in a previous chapter. We did an example in class, and that was 108. And the mass of carbon monoxide is 28 atomic mass units, right? Because carbon is 12 and oxygen is 16, they sum to 28 atomic mass units. And that changes your quantum volume, V sub Q, to 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 33 meters cubed when you plug in. So if we solve for our chemical potential of carbon monoxide, we get minus KT times the natural log of VZ internal over NVQ, we get minus 0 0.77 electron volts. All right, plugging into that equation from some of the stuff I previously mentioned. Now we have three choices, right? We're summing over all of our states. We've got uh, not occupied which was E is equal to zero and N equals to zero, which gave us the Gibbs factor of one. We had occupied by oxygen, right? Which gave us a Gibbs factor of 41. And now we have our new choice here, occupied by carbon monoxide. So plugging in into our Gibbs factor, E is uh, E to the minus E minus mu N divided by KT. Here we would have N equal to one, right? And we would have an energy for that state um, of negative 0.85 EV. Okay, that would be the energy of it being occupied by carbon monoxide. And then our chemical potential is negative 0.77 EV. So plugging all that into the equation, we would now have a Gibbs factor for it being occupied by carbon monoxide of 20. So summing to find our grand partition function, we'd have one, not occupied, plus 41, occupied by oxygen, plus 20, occupied by carbon monoxide, and that gives us 62. Now, if we want to find the probability that it's occupied by oxygen now, we would take the probability that it's occupied by oxygen, the Gibbs factor, divided by the partition function, which would be 41 over 62, which is 0 0.66. All right. So this is very similar to Schroeder. My numbers are just a little different because um, he does a lot of approximating, and I just grind it out and find the full value, but there it is. Okay. So what happened was we went from a 98% probability of being occupied by oxygen to only a 66% probability of being occupied by oxygen. That means our cells aren't getting enough oxygen, okay, compared to what our normal um, oxygen intake is in regular air. And that means that we slowly basically suffocate to death, kind of. Kind of cool, all right. Morbid and cool. So I hope that example shows you some of the usefulness and power of Gibbs factors and introduces some of the ideas that we'll be dealing with in this chapter as we proceed. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, I'll see you in class.